Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's Update Mental Cell Lymphoma webinar. I'm Angela, and I'll be the moderator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you're listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. And thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on mantle cell lymphoma webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsor of this webinar, Pharmacyclics and AbbVie Company and Janssen Biotech. We have callers from 44 states across the U.S. as well as patients and caregivers from 14 countries around the world. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Allison Rosenthal. Dr. Rosenthal is a hematologist and oncologist at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. She is also an assistant professor and serves as the chair of the Lymphoma Working Group at the Mayo Clinic, Arizona. Her research focuses on studying mantle cell lymphoma and best practices for treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenthal, for speaking at our webinar today. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thank you. So thank you to um, the Lymphoma Research Foundation for asking me to participate in this webinar. One of my favorite things to do is patient education type things. I think it's pretty important in regards to patients being empowered when it, goes, when it comes to going through treatment for things and understanding kind of why we're making the decisions we're making in the process of treating them. So I appreciate this opportunity, and I um, also want to thank everyone who's called in and taken time out of their day. I hope everybody gets something that they're looking for out of this talk. So as advertised, today we'll go over a little bit about mantle cell lymphoma in general, talk about treatment options if you've been newly diagnosed, talk about why clinical trials are so important, what therapies are coming up for mantle cell lymphoma, some quality of life concerns patients living with mantle cell lymphoma may have, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So to make sure we all start on the same page, I think it's important to understand that lymphoma is a type of blood cancer, and it affects certain cells in your immune system called lymphocytes, which are just a type of white blood cell. Within the spectrum of lymphoma, there are two major subtypes, there is Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, of which, of course, mantle cell is a subtype of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And just for reference, lymphoma is actually the most common blood cancer we see. So while mantle cell may not be the most common type, we certainly see a lot of this in an oncology practice. There are multiple parts of the immune system that can be involved when someone has a lymphoma. And when people hear the word lymphoma, we frequently think of big lymph nodes. However, because it's a blood cancer, it can really show up anywhere from your scalp to your toes. And so there are many areas outside of lymph nodes where we might actually find lymphoma. And in the case of mantle cell lymphoma, that can frequently be found in the blood or the bone marrow or even inside the GI tract. So when patients come to see me and are told that they have a new diagnosis of lymphoma, everyone always wants to know their stage. And so this is a graphical picture of how we do staging in lymphoma. And so another place where I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. But in general, patients who have one group of lymph nodes involved, so the picture on the left would be stage one, People with more than one group of lymph nodes involved, but half of the body, so either all above your diaphragm or all below it would be stage two. Lymph nodes in multiple locations throughout the body we would call stage three, and anywhere outside lymph nodes we would call stage four. In the setting of mantle cell lymphoma, there may be some impact on what your treatment recommendations are based on the stage, so it is important to establish what the stage is from the beginning. So to talk specifically about mantle cell a little bit, 
most people look at this type of lymphoma as a type of more aggressive B cell, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, though there are some indolent subtypes that exist, and so there is some difference in how people would present to us in clinic, how much symptoms they may have or how little symptoms they may have. For the most part, this is a condition that affects older people. So the average age of diagnosis is 68. I'll be honest, I have plenty of people who are younger than 68 in my practice, and so it can happen at any age. This just happens to be average. It affects men more commonly than women, and most people who are diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma will have stage 4 disease or advanced stage lymphoma when we find it. It doesn't mean anybody waited too long to be seen, and it doesn't change generally what we're going to do treatment-wise, but we have to know what the stage is so when we design a treatment, we're able to go back and say, yep, we covered all of our bases and we're happy with how much things have improved. So in mantle cells specifically, involvement within the GI tract is very common, and you will find that between different institutions or offices that some people get endoscopies, meaning a um, an upper GI or an EGD scope or a colonoscopy as part of their staging, some places reserve those tests for just if people have concerning symptoms uh, in an effort to find out if those are related to mantle cell involvement. One of the things that defines mantle cell lymphoma is something called cyclin D1 positivity. And so if you're reading through your pathology reports or clinical notes, you will frequently see that that's positive in the majority of people with mantle cell. And that actually helps us understand why those cells grow and how they're behaving the way that they are. For the most part, we have no idea why people get lymphoma. And I know that's frustrating and I wish I had the answer because I get that question multiple times a day. But I tell all of my patients it probably has nothing to do with anything you did or didn't or would have, should have done different had someone said to you, don't do that, you're going to get lymphoma. We, we're still better trying to understand what those things are. You can see in the top box on the right side of this slide that mantle cell lymphoma makes up a small piece of pie in regards to all the different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So it is relatively rare con compared to other subtypes, but places that, special, that have specialists in lymphoma will get lots of referrals for things that are not typically common. Um, and so it never hurts to get input from somewhere that has expertise in your particular diagnosis. So I had mentioned that there are different ways people can present with mantle cell lymphoma, and one of those different ways, other than showing up with just big lymph nodes and feeling crummy, is that some people will actually be found to have an abnormal blood test, and that's how we find it. So you might go to your regular doctor and get a blood test done, and they tell you your white blood cells are too high, or your lymphocytes are abnormal in your blood. And when that happens, people often will have a big spleen, which is part of your immune system, and if it's in the blood, it also means it's in the bone marrow. That's where all your blood is made and it comes from. So if we can detect lymphoma in the blood, by definition, it's also in your bone marrow. So we can often do a test called flow cytometry, which will help us decide if those lymphocytes or abnormal white blood cells are related to a diagnosis of mantle cell. Most people with mantle cell lymphoma will follow what's called a relapsing and remitting course, which means you get diagnosed and someone recommends treatment. Hopefully it goes into remission where we don't see it anymore. And over time, it tends to recur for most patients and they will need treatment again. So for the time being, we consider this a treatable but incurable type of lymphoma. Though there's a lot of research and a lot of effort being done around the world to try and change that one day. And we hope with support and ongoing clinical trials that we will be able to find a way to fix this permanently for patients in the future. So I included this slide um, mostly because I, I want people to be able to understand when they're seeing certain nomenclature or certain words in their notes, if you're trying to follow what your doctor is doing, some of this helps us predict whether or not we think things are going to move slowly and behave pretty well, or if there are features of your mantle cell lymphoma that make us a little bit more worried about behavior and picking the right therapy for people. So some of those things we keep an eye on are the KI-67, which some people call a key 67 What that is is it tells us how quickly those cells are turning over. 
and it gets reported as a percentage on a biopsy, so either from a lymph node or a bone marrow. And the higher that number is, the more likely it is that the lymphoma is growing pretty quickly. Most mantle cell lymphomas are over 30%, but the ones that present in the blood with a big spleen will have a lower number a lot of times. So that is something that we know pretty early that helps us gauge how quickly we think the lymphoma has kind of moved along. The other things that are important on this slide are a couple things on the right. So there's something called a complex karyotype, which means there are multiple genetic abnormalities in your lymphoma cells. The more of those people have, sometimes the harder time we have getting it under control with standard treatment like chemotherapy. There's also a rare variant of mantle cell lymphoma called blastoid or blastic variant. We don't know as much as we need to about that variant, but when we have that information from the get-go, it might impact our choice for what we do about it. And then finally, there's something called a deletion 17P, or a P53 mutation, and those things, when they're abnormal in the lymphoma cells, tell us that chemotherapy may not be the best approach. So to have that information ahead of time, it helps us try and pick the optimal therapy for the person we're seeing. So there are a lot of ways that we can manage people who have a new diagnosis of lymphoma, but what impacts our choice are some of the things I just mentioned, but also how old our, person, our patient is and the overall health of the patient. Most importantly, your preference. So I involve all of my patients in kind of shared decision-making about treatments. When we talk about options, we want to make sure that what we're recommending is in line with your goals and what you're looking for. And so with all of those factors in mind, we have different ways we can proceed. I put a couple definitions on here because I think it's important to know what the difference is. So some of you will be recommended something called maintenance therapy. Maintenance therapy means we give a low intensity or a low toxicity based treatment that helps us buy time and prevent the lymphoma from coming back or growing faster. And so a lot of times we have a discussion about the risks versus the benefits of doing so when that's recommended and we make a decision together. There's also a term called consolidation. And when we offer that to patients, it generally is in the form of a stem cell transplant. And we use that in a way to try and deepen and prolong the response people get. So what that means is if you're in remission at the end of some prescribed length of chemotherapy, we might recommend to someone to have a transplant to make that remission as deep as possible, so as minimal number of mantle cell cells left as we can imagine, and keep people in remission longer. So for now, and I hope this changes over the next few years, the way that we separate people is into younger and more fit patients, so limited other medical problems and in good health, compared to older or less fit patients, and then we match our therapies accordingly. So in younger people, we give fairly intensive chemotherapy. If it goes well and the scans clear up and the lymphoma goes away, we will frequently recommend a, a transplant using your own cells, which we call an autologous or auto stem cell transplant, and then follow that up with rituxan maintenance. For older people where we feel like the transplant may be too intensive or not safe, we do less intensive chemotherapy, though often still very effective for mantle cell lymphoma. And then we have a discussion about maintenance in that setting as well. And again, maintenance is offered to people in an effort to keep the lymphoma away for as long as we can. So there are a lot of different chemotherapies we can use when people are newly diagnosed and haven't had treatment yet. I've listed a few of them here just for reference and then also kind of indicated those that are a little less intensive under the older and less fit column and the ones that are a little bit more intensive in the younger and more fit column. But one of the things that is probably most important is if we're going for a good response in younger, more fit people, some incorporation of a drug called cytarabine, which may also be called ARIS-C, it's the same drug, is important to get people into a deep remission. Some patients will be diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma and not need treatment right away. So if you don't have huge lymph nodes, the blood counts don't look bad, 
you're not having B symptoms like bad night sweats or weight loss or fevers that we can attribute to the lymphoma, some people it's okay to observe to start with and then come in with treatment later when the lymphoma gets worse. On occasion, we will also have patients who present with localized lymphoma. So maybe big lymph nodes in, in the neck or a big tonsil or something somebody takes out and tells us it's mantle cell and that's all you've got. We can sometimes get by then with radiation, which is a localized treatment, or even shorter chemotherapy followed by radiation if we're just looking at one localized area. But those scenarios are not very common. Lastly, I think it's important to make a point that because we need better treatments for mantle cell lymphoma and because it would be nice to have a better way to stratify people from the beginning and know if we're picking the right treatment, clinical trials are always a good thing to consider if you are newly diagnosed or had prior treatment, but they definitely help us learn more about, the better, about a better way to do things. So, if you've already had treatment for mantle cell lymphoma and it has come back, we have a, a, f a few options in order to get that under better control. And so there's two words here that I also have defined for you. One is the word relapsed. So relapsed means you got treatment once, the lymphoma went away, it went into remission, and then it has come back. Refractory, which is also a word we sometimes use, means that either we gave you something and it didn't work as well as we hoped, or we gave you something and it went away, but within a few months it was already back. We, we give treatments with the hopes that things will stay away much longer than a few months. And so we use these words sometimes interchangeably, but I think it's important to know what we mean when we put them in your notes. So when we pick a, a treatment for people who've had prior therapy, we generally don't repeat treatment, though there are some exceptions to that if you've had an exceptionally long response. How long it lasted helps us decide if we're going to do something similar. So let's say you get chemotherapy the first time and your lymphoma is back within a year. Well, we could do chemo again or we could consider a different way to attack the lymphoma. Whereas if you get chemotherapy and lymphoma doesn't come back for another six years, we have a pretty good understanding then that chemotherapy might be reasonable to do again because we were able to buy a long time without having to worry about the lymphoma. And then obviously, depending on how you tolerated previous treatment, that helps us pick what to do next because we always want to keep people in a place where the benefit outweighs the risk of doing so. And so if it's too toxic, we have other ways that we can go about treating people. So this is a list of what we consider in people with relapsed or refractory mantle cell, and you'll see that the top couple of these all end in NIB, N-I-B, and so those are all what we call BTK, or Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and those are very effective drugs for people with recurrent mantle cell lymphoma and frequently things we use first. The other things on this list don't have such high response rates, but can be effective for recurrent mantle cell lymphoma. And so they're all FDA approved with the exception of venetoclax, which we use what's called off-label, meaning the FDA doesn't recognize it yet as an approved treatment for mantle cell, but there's good clinical trial data behind it that we think it's an effective drug and we hope it will be approved soon. As mentioned, you could get a different kind of chemotherapy. And then for some people, so people who are young with recurrent lymphoma or have some of those high-risk variants I spoke about on that, on that first slide, we do sometimes consider what's called an allogeneic stem cell transplant or an allo transplant, which is the type of transplant where you get cells from someone else. That is a bit of a more riskier procedure than using your own cells, but comes with the potential trade-off of potentially being a curative treatment for this. So you may ask yourself, well, why don't we do that first if it cures people? But it's mainly because we have good treatments otherwise. Allo transplants are difficult to do in people over the age of 70, which many of our mantle cell patients are that age already when they're diagnosed and the risk associated makes it difficult to justify doing in at least a handful of patients. So it may come up if you're in the right subgroup of people to talk about it, but it, there isn't a ton of scientific data behind it because we don't get into that situation very often. So I wanted to compare and contrast a little bit for you some of the BTK drugs that are available. 
So those ones that were at the top of the last list, including erbrutinib, which is also known as Imbruvica, acalabrutinib, which is also known as Colquence, and xanabrutinib, which is the newest one. So here you can see that we've had these type of treatments for the last several years. They are all oral therapies, meaning you can take them as pills at home, which some people prefer compared to coming in for infusions often. But they have different side effect profiles. And so which one we pick is usually determined by what else we're looking at in the person we see. So if we have somebody who needs to be on blood thinners for good reason, we might not pick a brute dip because we know that it increases people's risk of bleeding. If we have people who have chronic migraine headaches and really struggle with having headache on a daily or nearly daily basis, acalabrutinib may not be the best option because that has a higher incidence of headaches. So fortunately, all of these drugs work very well in this setting, and so we don't have a big difference in how effective they are, but we often can choose between them when it comes to side effects. And so if you're tried on one and you have bad side effects that require us to stop it, you can be rechallenged on a similar drug with different side effects. If you get treatment with one of these and the lymphoma grows anyways and it just doesn't work as a good treatment, switching you to one of the other ones probably won't work either. And so in an upcoming slide, we'll talk about what to do in that setting, but these can be interchangeable based on tolerance and side effects, but if one of them doesn't work, the other ones are probably not gonna work either. So here's my little bit of a plug on clinical trials. So we need clinical trials in all types of lymphoma, but mantle cell in particular, because with it being not that common of a lymphoma, it's harder for us to do big research studies. We need those studies to get new treatments approved. We need those studies to know what might be better tolerated. And we also need those studies so that when we get to the point where we're putting people on treatment where we don't say, well, you get six rounds of this or you get six months of this, how do we know how long they need to be on it? And so there are a number of trials looking at all of those things in this setting. Hearing about clinical trials can be overwhelming and can sound kind of scary, to which some people's first response is, well, I don't want to be tested on or I don't want to be a guinea pig. I understand that completely. So to clear up a little bit of what we mean by clinical trials, I have included this slide so that you know exactly how we get to each point. So before new drugs are tested in people, there are preclinical studies that are done. Sometimes that means that we've just tested drugs with mantle cell cells in a Petri dish or in a made-up environment in a lab. Sometimes that means we've tested drugs in animal models that have been given mantle cell lymphoma. But before it gets to humans, if it's a brand new drug, some kind of lab study has happened to make sure we think it's going to be effective. Phase one clinical trials are the earliest clinical trials in which we test things in people. So in a phase one study, what the intent is, is to figure out what dose should we be using and is it safe to use? So a lot of times the phase one trials would potentially include anybody with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Maybe it's not specific to mantle cell, but maybe it is. Phase two studies are based on information we get from phase one studies. So if we included anybody with lymphoma on a phase one study, but we saw, oh, it works really well in Hodgkin's and it works really well in mantle cell lymphoma, Phase two narrows down the pool a bit and we get a little bit more specific with who we're treating. A phase two study is designed to tell us, does it work? So we already know what dose we wanna use and we already know what side effects might be expected from the earlier study, but now we wanna know if it really works well in a particular condition. So a lot of studies are phase two and some of the phase two studies might be, well, we know these two drugs work independently so for the first time, we're going to combine them and see if they work better together. Phase three studies are advanced studies and the largest studies we do. So it might put a couple hundred people, let's say, on a phase three study. Those studies mean that we found something we know we want to use, we think it's going to work very well in whatever condition we're treating, and we want to compare it to what we already have. So in mantle cell lymphoma, an example there might be Okay, we know abrutinib is what we like to use when people have a recurrent mantle cell lymphoma, but we have a new drug that looks like it might work better. 
So we're going to take people and randomize them on a trial, meaning you get a coin flip and you either get what we always use, which might be a brutinib or whatever, or you get randomized to the arm of the new drug. And then that study goes forward and we compare and contrast. If the new drug or the new treatment is as good as or better than what we've got, it gets approved. So then the FDA says, yep, thank you for that information. We now have a new treatment that you can offer your patients for, for mantle cell lymphoma. Sometimes those things also get approved off phase two studies if the data is really good and we don't have a lot of options in that space. So those are the different things. And so if your doctor is talking to you about going on a clinical trial, it's important to know what phase, what type of trial, and what the intention is. So that helps then make an informed decision if it's something that sounds of interest to you. But clinical trials are always based on voluntary participation. You have to give us consent to put you on a trial. And if you ever do that and decide to change your mind, you can withdraw your consent at any time. So currently, there are ongoing clinical trials for all of these things. New diagnosis, people who got a treatment and it didn't work, people who had previous treatment and needed again, or for people who are in remission and we want to find out the best way to keep them there. So the website I've included here, which is clinicaltrials.gov, is a public website that you can easily type into the search boxes, mantle cell lymphoma, or you can search for trials in the US or trials in Germany or wherever you are. And oftentimes on that website, it'll tell you exactly what centers are running that study. So if you live in Texas and you wanna know if MD Anderson is running a study, you can find it on that website or probably theirs. Or if you live in Nevada and you're not sure where the closest center is that's running a study, you can search it on that website too. So that's a, a resource for you that I encourage you to look at if you're looking for options outside of what your doctor at home has to offer you. So I, I'm sure there will be a question about this, so trying to preemptively educate a little bit. So there are some newer treatments that are coming around for mantle cell lymphoma, one of those being CAR-T therapy, which we'll talk about on another slide, one of those strategies being, can we stop using chemotherapy and use some of these newer drugs to avoid having to have people get the side effects associated with chemotherapy? There's something called minimal residual disease, or MRD, which we are using as a companion test right now with clinical trials. So what that means is you can't just order this for no reason in whatever office you're in. It means that we are trying to understand if there is a blood test or a bone marrow test that we can use that might be more sensitive or a better predictor of what's going to happen with lymphoma than scans, so than CAT scans or PET scans. So we have this information for another kind of blood cancer called CLL, and we are working on getting this information on how to use it in mantle cell lymphoma, but it is still a research question. And then lastly, which is something that I'm interested in studying, is can we, ahead of time, know enough about people's mantle cell lymphoma to not have to pick therapy just based on if they're young or old, to do a better job of understanding the biology of your particular lymphoma so that we recommend the right treatment from the beginning and it's less of a one-size-fits-all approach. So CAR T cell therapy is a fancy immunotherapy that we have to offer for some aggressive types of B cell lymphoma now. And this is coming very soon for mantle cell lymphoma. But basically what happens is we can teach your immune system to do a better job of fighting off mantle cell lymphoma cells if we take out a piece of it. So we can collect T cells, which is part of your immune system from your blood. We can send it to a lab where in that lab they tell the T cells, all right, your enemy is B cells. So we're going to reteach you to look for B cells, and we're going to tell you to look for this marker or flag on the surface of B cells, and then we're going to send you back to the body and do your job better. So right now that process takes about three weeks to do outside the body, and then when the cells are sent back, we can infuse them through a vein, and they basically are seek and destroy missiles for anything that looks like a B cell. So when you have mantle cell lymphoma, and that's a B cell lymphoma, it should target those cells, and then when it sees one and binds to it, it should activate the rest of the immune system and tell the cancer cells to die. 
So this is a much different treatment than chemotherapy, but it's pretty exciting because we know that one of the ways that, that cancer cells can resist chemotherapy is by not having a good enough immune response there. So this is a way to kind of override that a bit. So in mantle cell lymphoma, we expect that this will be approved sometime this year. I would like to take the time to apologize for that. Um, and this is based on a study in which there were about 60 patients who received this therapy, and they had all had multiple prior treatments. So this will not be something available to people who are newly diagnosed, at least not right away. But the response rates were very high, and people who went into remission was also a very high number, and it seemed to stick. So when we're looking at clinical trials and new treatments, the things that are important to us are, is it tolerable? That's obviously very important. And does it work? And the way that we can manage does it work or measure does it work is how many people respond, do people go into remission, and how long does it stick? So anything that looks like it works really well but it only lasts for two weeks is not great because then we're back to the drawing board as to what to do next. So for this type of treatment, it looks like most people respond, and those that do can keep having response for a few years, and so that's pretty exciting. I had mentioned venetoclax in a prior slide. This is also an oral treatment that we have approved for CLL and probably will get approved soon for mantle cell lymphoma. It works pretty well by itself, and it has pretty limited side effects, and so it is well tolerated. But it does seem to work better when you combine it with other drugs that we know are active in mantle cell. So those trials are ongoing. We may see this get added to first line or the first treatments we give people, but those trials are just now being done also. And then there are some other combinations. So there's a drug called umbralisib, which I don't know who names these things. I know they're hard to say, but that's a new drug we're trying in mantle cell lymphoma and other types of lymphoma that looks like it also works better when we combine it with treatments that do work. Um, and so, so the other things that I've included here are things that are pretty early in development. So when things have a name that is letters and numbers, those are pretty early development drugs, and they don't get a name until we kind of have an application for them. So what I've included here are many things that are what we call BTK inhibitors, so like abrutinib, but some of these are specifically designed to try and work in patients where they already got a drug like abrutinib and it stopped working. It found a workaround and the lymphoma grew through it anyways. So these are different enough, they may work in that setting, but the trials are just being done now for us to find out. There's a drug called palbocyclib, which is something called a CDK inhibitor which means it works on the cell cycle. So the cell cycle gets triggered and tells cells to grow in lots of different kinds of lymphoma. So if we can block that signal so the cells aren't growing for no reason, it stands to reason that it might work against lymphoma cells. But that particular treatment seems to have limited impact all by itself and will probably have to be combined with something else. And then there's this new drug called sermtuzumab, which I personally don't have any experience with yet, but it's a new antibody that got orphan drug designation, which means it fills a space in mantle cell lymphoma and some other lymphomas that may be we don't have other treatments like it for. So that may become available soon for patients with mantle cell as well. I want to spend the last couple of slides just talking about some quality of life concerns because when you get told that you have a lymphoma that's treatable but not curable, that can be pretty overwhelming. And then you have to figure out, okay, how sick am I going to be with treatment, and how am I going to live with this? What is it going to look like? So oftentimes patients will have a lot of questions about what can I do? What can I do to maintain my health? What can I do to tolerate treatment better? What can I do to keep the lymphoma at bay? So there's a lot of questions I get about nutrition and exercise, which we'll cover on the next slides. But fatigue, obviously, and feeling tired can be a major concern when you have a diagnosis like lymphoma. And sometimes that gets better with treatment, and sometimes it doesn't. So it's important to know that there are some strategies for managing fatigue, and one of those strategies is actually exercising. So not going crazy if you're not typically a regular exerciser, but making sure you get some daily activity and actually helps manage fatigue, and paying attention to the times of day that you actually feel well, and practicing some what we call energy conservation strategies. 
So if mornings are best for you, you run your errands and you get what you need done in the morning and you rest in the afternoon. Or if you're a little bit slower to get going and you find that late afternoons are better, you plan your day around those things so that you can maintain as much of a normal quality of life as possible. We obviously worry very much about short-term and long-term effects of treatment. So during treatment, we have to make sure people don't get infections and nausea is controlled and all those types of things. But there are definitely some longer-term effects like chemo brain, which we obviously understand not well, neuropathy, sometimes heart or kidney side effects. And so it's important we have all these considerations in mind when we're taking care of you and that you let us know what's bothering you so we can do our best to minimize those symptoms. There's a lot of obvious uncertainty, fear of recurrence. When you get told you're gonna have something that comes back, how do you plan for things? How do I know when I can buy a new house? Do we plan a vacation? Am I gonna be okay to go? So we individualize those conversations with patients. And some people will find that they're scared to ask other people for help or they're worried they're gonna be a burden to their families that they're living with because they're sick. But cancer is a diagnosis that affects many people. And when you're part of a family unit or a community of some kind, most often those people are willing to shoulder some of the burden with you because they are your people and they wanna help support you through it. I think having a connection to others can be really important. And so both with Lymphoma Research Foundation as a resource, as well as some other online forums, I think it's pretty easy these days through the internet to find someone else who may have the same diagnosis as you or local to you or coming to some of the patient education things that LRF typically does in person that are currently um, webinars and not in person due to COVID. Um, but these things are all resources for you and there's always ways to find other people in your situation. So from a nutrition perspective, lots of centers have nutritionists, so you absolutely can seek that kind of advice. I don't think personally that there's any particular diet that someone with a lymphoma diagnosis has to be on, but I tell people to eat how you feel best. I get a lot of questions about, do I have to avoid sugar? Should I be on an alkaline diet? Are there specific foods I should avoid? We don't have good answers to any of those questions, but probably not. So if you feel best on an alkaline diet, by all means, okay with me. If you feel best on a vegan diet, okay with me. So these are all things you have to just kind of see how your body tolerates it. And keep in mind, when you're going through active treatment, some things may taste weird, or you may have appetite for different things, or it may be hard to eat a full meal at a time and snack size meals are better. So listening to your body and making those judgment calls and discussing with your doctor is important. Vitamins, supplements, and antioxidants. So lots of things you can find on the internet about this. Lots of people want to take vitamins, minerals, do things to boost their immune system. I would caution people who are on active treatment to make sure you, di you discuss these things specifically with your doctor for two main reasons. One, some of these things can actually render some of the treatments we're offering less effective while you're getting them. And two, some of these things will interact with the drugs to the point that they actually can cause worse side effects. So we wanna make sure that we know what you're taking so we keep you in the most safe space. And some people will be fine to take these supplements and things when they're between treatments, and some might be okay on treatment, but that conversation is important to have ahead of time so we make sure we're minimizing your toxicity but optimizing your response. Same with herbal type things. It's important to understand that for most of this stuff, the FDA does not regulate it. So hopefully what's in there is what it says it is, but it doesn't have to follow the same quality controls as the FDA does for medications. So just be cautious when you're looking into these things and buying different supplements as far as, is this safe to take? Am I getting what I'm paying for? Same with if you see a naturopath. I think they do their best to recommend things we think are gonna be helpful to people, but make sure that if you're going that route as well, that you discuss it with the person who is actually treating your lymphoma so everybody knows what to keep an eye out for. And then I had mentioned exercise as well. So we know from research that's been done in all types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma that people who are more active than not have better survival. So that may be related to not feeling that bad from your cancer, but also may be related to just overall better quality of life and overall better health. So it is absolutely okay to exercise to your tolerance when you're on treatment or off. Exercise can improve your sleep, so that's important because sometimes sleep is interrupted with treatments. It can also reduce depression, stress, fatigue, and can actually help with your GI tract function and minimize nausea and constipation, believe it or not. 
with that, I think I'll end my talk and turn it back over to the LRF team. Great, thank you so much. Um, before we open the program up to questions, I wanna share some information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation that may be helpful as you navigate lymphoma and long-term survivorship. LRF is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The Foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment specific resources, programs, and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link or via LRF's website at lymphoma.org if you're on your phone. The LRF helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma, as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. The Lymphoma Support Network connects patients and caregivers with volunteers who have similar experiences to help give other strength to meet the challenges they may have to face. We also offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest information. We have comprehensive books on understanding NHL, HL, CLL, and the transplantation process. We offer a variety of easy to understand fact sheets on each of the subtypes of lymphoma as well as supportive care topics and a mantle cell lymphoma fact sheet that may be relevant to your experience. Our mobile app, Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content as well as unique tools to help manage your disease. The app is available for free download in the Apple App Store and in Google Play, and I encourage you all to download the app today. Finally, we have launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. I really hope that you'll take advantage of some of the great resources and services that the Lymphoma Research Foundation provides. If you have any questions regarding what you learned today, or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to the Lymphoma Research Foundation through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. Thank you again for your time today. Uh, we'll now begin our Q&A portion of the program. This is a reminder, please keep your questions as general as possible so that the entire audience can benefit from their answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your question through the Q&A box on your screen. We'll take as many questions as possible, but if you have a question that does not get answered, you can always reach back out to our helpline. And now we'll get started with our first question, which is, um, Dr. Rosenthal, is it something feasible to use the watch and wait approach on first reoccurrence after long first CR? Question. So for people who have active mantle cell lymphoma, meaning blood tests are abnormal or a scan shows that it's active, it is okay, in my opinion anyways, to watch and wait if you don't have any symptoms. So if there doesn't appear to be any trouble soon coming from the lymph nodes or significant low blood counts or something, it's okay to watch and wait whether or not you had a long first remission or not. So the approach I take for patients is usually if it's not bothering you, it's not bothering me, we're going to keep a close eye on it and we'll leave it be until it needs attention. Um, but that obviously is an individualized approach and it depends on some of the features of your lymphoma. I think it would be hard to do that if you, um, for example, have the blastic variant of mantle cell I think a lot of people would be reluctant to just sit and wait to see what it's going to do. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, is there any guidance with regard to duration of our maintenance after initial chemo? I was initially on course for two years. My doctor is now recommending to continue our maintenance until disease returns. So that varies a little bit too. So it depends on if you went to transplant or not. So in the setting of getting less intensive chemotherapy, so let's say you get our top or bendamustine and rituxan chemotherapy, there is data to suggest that staying on maintenance rituxan indefinitely until recurrence after our chop may help as far as what we call pro, um, progression-free survival or PFS, meaning you should stay in remission longer on that maintenance than not. There is less data for that benefit after bendamustine and rituxan. However, lots of people still get maintenance in that setting. It just isn't as well data-driven by 
the clinical trials we have available. So my thoughts on indefinite maintenance are probably decisions that are made in people who either we think re-challenging them with chemotherapy would be unwise, or in the setting of COVID, some people have stayed on more gentle treatments in an effort to avoid having to do something more immunosuppressive or more aggressive. Um, but outside of long-term maintenance until relapse after our CHOP, I'm not aware of there being any clinical trial-driven di data to stay on it that long. But a constant um, discussion about the risks and benefits. So if you're tolerating it well and the lymphoma is gone, it probably doesn't hurt to continue it. It just, that may be an individualized decision you and your doctor have made. Okay, great, thanks for clarifying that. Um, our next question is, I have relapsed three times now and have been put in a calibrutinib. Any thoughts on this treatment? So it's a great treatment for mantle cell lymphoma. Um, pretty well tolerated. You know, the, if there's a downside to it, it's that you have to take it twice a day. Um, but this, these drugs, and I didn't cover this in my talk, but these BTK inhibitors or Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor drugs are aimed at what we call the B-cell receptor signaling pathway. So there are multiple enzymes and checkpoints along that pathway that can be inappropriately on all the time in B-cell lymphomas. And so what that drug does is it actually tells the immune system that's cranking out these extra lymphoma cells to knock it off. We don't need you growing so fast. We don't need you making all these cells that are not helpful. And so it directly blocks one of the steps in that pathway. So it's a very good treatment for people to be on, generally pretty tolerable, and the responses can last for years. And so that's one of the settings in which when we put people on one of those treatments, you're on them until either there's a bad side effect where we have to take you off or it stops working. So it would be really great to understand if there's a certain place beyond which we're no longer getting benefits. So what if we could stop people at two years instead of continuing them on indefinitely. And so some of the research questions like that are, are currently being studied now. We, we learn that information from what we know about CLL, which is a more common type of lymphoma that uses some of these similar drugs. Initially, we had put people on them indefinitely, but now we're starting to see there are certain situations in which we can actually give people a break from therapy. So I'm hopeful we will learn the same information in mantle cell. Great, thank you. And this is um, a follow-up to uh, your answer before. You might have partially just answered it, but I'm going to say the full thing just for the second part. Um, can you comment on how you decide which BTK inhibitor you would recommend for a given patient? What are the considerations, especially for relapse? So mostly based on the side effect profile. So mostly based on things that we want to try and avoid. So all three that are currently approved, and I imagine the ones that will eventually be approved, are pretty well tolerated, but there are some significant risks in the minority of people that we want to try and avoid. So again, for abrutinib in particular, which is the one we've had the longest, the two main concerning side effects are risk for bleeding and risk for atrial fibrillation, which is a funny heart rhythm that can put people at risk for stroke. So if you already have difficult to control AFib, we don't want to put you on that drug. If you have AFib, it's not a reason you can't go on that drug, but it should be well controlled and monitored for. And again, if you have to be on blood thinners and we don't have a choice, now there may be an alternative that may be safer, though I have some patients on abrutinib and blood thinners. We just have to be very careful about monitoring those people. Um, so mostly side effect profile. I will, would also say sometimes, honestly, it's based on financial, financial things. So if we prescribe you one and the copay is $4,000 a month and we tell you you're going to have to be on it for several years, that's nearly impossible for the average person to, to take care of. So many of the companies that make these drugs have assistance programs in place because they know these treatments are necessary and we want to make sure that people don't miss out on them for financial reasons. But sometimes that is something we have to factor into our decision to make sure it's a treatment we can continue to get for you. Great. Um, our next question is, are you familiar with the Stanford study regarding tumor-based vaccines for MCL? Is this a promising form of new treatment? I am not familiar with that specific study, though I am familiar with the idea that we have tried using vaccine trials in other um, types of cancer in the past. So it really just probably is based on this idea that when you have a cancer of the immune system, 
which anyone who has a lymphoma does, are there better ways that we can get your own immune system to do a better job of controlling this so we don't have to give people yucky things like chemotherapy? And so a lot of the immunotherapy type things or ways to boost the immune system that are treatments we're studying and being designed are, are done so in an effort to try to get your own immune system to do a better job of controlling things. So I can't speak to the specifics of what they are actually using that vaccine to make antibodies to, but it would be on the basis of just trying to get a better immune response, um, at least to the best of my knowledge. Uh, next question is, is there a certain age where CAR-T would not be considered? If so, why is that? That's a very good question. So probably. Um, so some of the CAR-T studies had age caps and some did not. Now, CAR-T cell therapy, while it is technically an immunotherapy, can come with some potentially dangerous side effects, and they're unique to CAR-T therapy. So some of the age recommendation for things like transplant or CAR-T are related to whether or not we think that we can safely offer and provide a treatment to people. So for example, in CAR T cell therapy, one of the major side effects is something called cytokine release syndrome. And cytokines are what make people feel really crummy when you have the flu, let's say. So it's the things that cause fever and body aches and low appetite and fatigue. And so when we turn on the immune system, we actually activate a lot of cytokines. And so people can get a very risk immune system response where they get all those same symptoms. So if there are organ function concerns or if someone is very frail and having this quick attack of the immune system might compromise them, we would not offer them that kind of therapy. So, so age isn't the only thing we consider, but I, but I think over the age of 70, 75, it, we get into a little bit of a tricky category where we don't have a lot of data because the people who went on the trials were probably not much older. Um, so again, another kind of risk versus benefit assessment there. Hopefully, as time goes on and we understand these types of treatments a little bit better, we have better ways to mitigate that risk and that toxicity so we can offer it to the broadest range of patients that we can. Thank you. Um, if you had an auto stem cell transplant and then relapsed, would you still consider another transplant? Good question. So we only do auto transplants once in the setting of lymphoma. So I tell all of my patients who go to auto transplant, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for you. Um, that doesn't mean that someone could not be considered for the other kind of transplant, the allogeneic stem cell transplant or cells from somebody else. Again, the, the risks and benefits associated with that type of transplant are different, and we reserve that option for people who are running out of approved options that are young and otherwise well enough to consider it with a good donor situation. So with somebody that we think has an immune system close enough to yours, but different enough that we think that it would take care of the lymphoma in the long term for us. So you would never have a second auto transplant, but some people who go through an auto transplant may go on to receive an allo transplant. Great, thank you. Um, when do you expect CAR T cell therapy for mantle cell lymphoma to be improved? This year. So sometime in the next month, we hope to hear whether or not the FDA has actually approved uh, the, current, the product that I included in my talk. And once it's approved, it will take some time for centers to get certified to give it to people, for the laboratories to be up with all of the um, techniques and tools that they need in order to get the cells manufactured. Um, and so it probably is something that people will be able to get through their insurance sometime before the end of this year, um, but probably a better kind of well-oiled machine by sometime next year. Great. Um, our next question is, once um, a COVID-19 vaccine becomes available, would mantle cell lymphoma patients on maintenance rituximab be able to get the vaccine? Is COVID-19 especially dangerous for mantle cell lymphoma patients? Okay, so let me take that first part and I'll just answer a question, I guess, based on vaccines in general. So vaccines come in two varieties, either inactivated, so dead virus, or 
live vaccines, which would still be live virus. So the MMR vaccine, the one that co that covers measles, mumps, and rubella, is a live vaccine. And so in people who have lymphoma, we try and avoid live vaccines because if your immune system is compromised, it is possible that you could actually get the virus from having a live vaccine rather than just mount an immune response to it. That's a bit of a theoretic concern, not something that like we ran into over and over again and then changed our mind. So we try and avoid live vaccines when we can. I believe that the COVID-19 vaccines that are being developed will be inactivated, so dead virus, which is what the flu vaccine is. And so any of our lymphoma patients can safely receive inactivated or dead virus vaccines. So we, we offer those to people often. The question about rituximab and vaccines is difficult to answer. So the reason that that is even a concern is because rituximab depletes B cells. We want it to because that's what it's going after. But your B cells make antibodies. And your antibodies are what mount a response to an infection or mount a response to a vaccine. So after receiving rituximab, you will probably have at least a blunted antibody response to something for several months after you've gotten your last dose of rituxan. So the vaccine won't hurt immediately post rituxan if it's dead, but you might not mount a full response to it unless you have normal antibody production, which generally comes back somewhere between 8 and 12 months after you finish rituxan, but it varies from person to person. That's kind of a rough guesstimate I give my patients. Um, so that was the first part of the question. And then the second part of that question about danger with COVID-19. So we know that the mortality rate, meaning people who don't survive COVID, is probably higher in people with chronic diseases like heart and lung problems or cancer compared to people who don't have any of those diagnoses. So when able, I would still continue to take as much precaution as possible as far as social distancing, wearing a mask, avoiding large crowds if you can. I realize we are all tired of being locked up and restricted in some way or another, no matter where we live at this point. And so I would just exercise caution. It, it's difficult to say without knowing the individual's kind of overall risk. But. Great, thank you. Um, next question is for a fit 67-year-old. What types of side effects might be associated with bendamustine? For a 67-year-old? It's yeah. generally a pretty well-tolerated chemotherapy. So when I look at tolerance of chemotherapy, people always say, how sick am I going to be? And usually that means, am I going to be throwing up? So on the scale of how likely it is to cause nausea versus not, bendamustine is pretty low on that scale for most people. I've had, we give lots of bendamustine for lots of kinds of lymphoma. I've had two people in my career tolerate it so poorly that they had hor horrible nausea. That's not expected, and that is something that would be a reason to not continue it, but most people don't experience that. So pretty well tolerated. The biggest issue we run into with people is whether or not it's too hard on the bone marrow. So if we find that people's blood counts are too low to stay on schedule with treatment, that ends up being, honestly, the biggest concern we run into in, in, in practice with bendamustine is sometimes it just is hard to recover from, and we can't get in as much as we originally have planned, but pretty well tolerated. Our next question is, I had a relapse five years after our hyper CVAD confirmed by biopsy. We elected watchful waiting. On my next three stage, the MCL was not detectable and has not reappeared after six years. Is it common for relapsed MCL to disappear? Common, no. Possible, yes. Um, I tell people every day in my clinic, I learn something new from lymphoma every day. So, um, we're always happy when that happens. Perhaps you had a very small volume relapse and the immune system activated itself and, and took care of it. Um, it's very difficult, even though you've gone six years for any of us to say you're, quote, cured of this type of lymphoma. But the longer you go without treatment, the better, because A, you avoid toxicity of treatment, and B, hopefully we have new and better things that come up if or ever again you need treatment. So that's Great news that you haven't needed anything in six years, and I hope it continues to last. Great. Um, I think we've time for just maybe two more questions. Um, the second to last one is, my husband was diagnosed with MCL and fought 10 years before passing. How concerned should my 34-year-old son be about likelihood of getting MCL, too? Oh, another very good question. So 
Kind of piggybacking on my response that we don't know why people get lymphoma. We, we don't think it's a genetic thing. So, we, so unlike things like breast or colon cancer, where if, if you tell your doctor, oh, my mom and my aunt or my grandma and my grandpa all had the same diagnosis, they might refer someone to a genetic counselor for genetic testing. We don't currently have any genetic testing for lymphoma because we don't know of there being any specific genes involved with familial risk. So for the most part, I tell people, you, this is probably not something you got from mom and dad and probably not something you would pass on to your kids. There is no screening test for that at this time. Thank you. Um, and our last question for today is, how effective is rituxan alone on stage four mantle cell lymphoma? Ooh, uh, wow, I'd probably have to go back and dig a bit into the original research in mantle cell. It's, it's probably not enough to get somebody into remission. I would be surprised if that happens. However, it is an anti-B cell drug. And so if you have a fairly slow growing mantle cell and good reason to avoid other types of treatments that we would typically give with rituxan, it's not unreasonable to give it a try for as long as it helps, but it is not a standard recommendation to use it by itself. And I would have to imagine the only time I would do that is in the setting of feeling like our other treatments would, would not be safe to do. Now that's different than giving maintenance. So if things are under control and you're continuing on single agent rituxan, I think that's a different question. Um, and in that setting to keep a lid on things, it tends to work pretty well once we have good control. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that was great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rosenthal. And now we're just gonna conclude the program. Um, Thank you again to each of you for joining us on today's call, and we hope you found the information both informative and also hopeful. We'd also like to thank our sponsor again for making this program possible, Pharmacyclics and Abbey Company and Janssen Biotech. Please remember, if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to the LRF helpline at 800-500-9976. Also, at the conclusion of this program, you'll receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. I would ask that you please take a few moments to complete this evaluation as these are important for helping LRF to ensure they deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us and have a wonderful day.